2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> the Bible says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest, uh, lest ye also, being led a- away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and and forever. Amen. Uh, This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. It has such great truth. But notice the Bible teaches us here uh, that if if we are not growing, then we are in danger of falling from our own steadfastness. And it doesn't matter where you are in your Christian life. If you're not taking steps forward, There's that danger there. And how do we grow? Well, the Bible says we grow in grace. And that's what we're going to look at here tonight. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to look at it. I pray that you would uh, give us, Lord, the instruction and um, the direction that we need to take steps forward in our life. And Lord, I pray also uh, that you would... Um, you would use this truth for our life, uh, not only for tonight, but uh, for each day, uh, for tomorrow and the the days that lie ahead, that we would continue to take steps forward for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that you'd give me the words to say and the strength to say it. I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be uh, hearers and doers of your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard the story of a a flight. It it had been a a long flight, and and the crew of that particular flight was was really tired. And uh, this was more, this was made even more apparent by the the rough landing of the aircraft. Now, this particular airline had a policy uh, that the pilot must stand by the door as the people exited to thank them for flying with the with that airline, and, and the pilot was kind of nervous because of uh, the hard landing, but he stood faithfully by, and surprisingly enough, everyone was very gracious and, uh, and really didn't say much about anything on the flight. They just hurried off, and it came down to the very last passenger on that plane, and it was a, a, an elderly lady, and she was walking with a walker, and she was kind of waddling over to the pilot, and and uh, she got right up to that captain and said, can I ask you a question? And um, the captain said, sure. She said, did we land or were we shot down? <laughs> now, we, we think about the last couple of, of years that we've experienced, and as another year comes to an end, it's incredible to think that we're already in October of 2022. And maybe as you look back at the last couple of years and you look back even at this year, uh, you're wondering the same thing. You're wondering if you've landed the plane or, or if you were shot down. Now, now, Peter is building here to his climax. He, he has faithfully warned the early churches of false teachers. Uh, and now he's speaking of God's grace and the grace that is needed for our life each and every day. Now, what is grace? Grace is the unlimited resource of God. Grace is simply the unlimited resource of God. It is the powerful inner working of the Holy Spirit to provide the strength that we need to live the Christian life and to also develop us into his image. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 says this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, Paul, who was a murderer and and now is a missionary, probably wouldn't be allowed or invited to many churches today. I mean, he had that testimony. And, And he's not throwing his hands up in the air saying, I am what I am. No, 
he's excited about the change in his life. And he's saying, listen, I am where I am today because of the grace of God. It was evident in my life. He says, which was bestowed upon me was not, that which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. And so we notice God's grace is working in our life each and every day. And I, I want to give you some thoughts here tonight about God's grace and that work in our life, practical thoughts. Number one, let's think about tonight the potential of grace, the potential of grace. Now, the Bible simply says this, but grow in grace. And so we understand tonight that there is an opportunity. There is potential to be a part of this grace that is offered to the child of God. God says, grow in this grace. Now, what does this grace accomplish in our life? Just some thoughts here tonight. Number one, or letter A, God's grace will strengthen the Christian. God's grace will strengthen the Christian. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in that grace. Be, be strengthened in that grace. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Notice there the stress, uh, the stressing the thought of faithfulness and it's important for us to be faithful. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And the Bible says here to present or to give the message to faithful men, that they would give that message to others also. But the Bible says that we are to be strong in that grace that is available. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 the Bible says, but the God of all grace, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You know, it's interesting to note from this passage of Scripture how, how the Bible describes who God is to us. And, and, and the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 3, it, it says that God is the God of all comfort, that all comfort comes from him. And, and even when we come alongside of someone as a Christian and we give comfort, we have to understand that that comfort doesn't come from us. If we're going to be any comfort, it's going to come from God through us. He's the God of all comfort. And, uh, and the Bible describes God this way. But also notice the scripture says here in 1 Peter 5.10 that he's the God of all grace. The God of all grace. All grace comes from him. Uh, Winston Churchill said this, uh, kites fly highest against the wind, not with the wind. And when we tie those two thoughts together, the trial of our life or the, the trouble or burden of our life, and then we pair that wonderfully with the grace of God, it helps us to get to places that we cannot get by ourselves. God's grace gives us the strength uh, that we need to take that next step in the difficulties of our life. God's grace will strengthen the Christian. But also, and maybe tonight you need God's strength, then you need God's grace. You need God's grace. Letter B, God's grace will, will, will stabilize the Christian, will stabilize the Christian. It, it says to be rooted in Christ. Colossians, turn there, if you could, with me. Colossians chapter 2, and, uh, and notice what the Bible says here, verse number 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. The Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, uh, the Lord, so, so walk ye in him. How did we receive 
Christ Jesus the Lord. Well, we received him by, say it, you know it, faith. We received him by faith. And so we have to walk by faith. Uh, The Christian life doesn't stop walking by faith after salvation. We keep walking by faith. And, And so it says walk by faith. Verse six, look at this. It defines this for us, rooted and built up in him established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's a wonderful theme as we come into this weekend, as we think about thanksgiving. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so the Bible says to be rooted. And this is building below the baseline, right? You can't be built up until you have a foundation, until you're rooted. If you are Building up without the roots, you're going to tumble over. And so the Bible says rooted and then built up in him. We need to be rooted as as Christians. We need to know what we believe. We need to be rooted uh, in the grace of God. And so many Christians are, are like tumbleweed Christians. You know what a tumbleweed is, right? You watch the old Western and, you know, you see two guys dueling off and What do you see in the background? Every time there's a tumbleweed blowing in the wind, every time. And that's, many Christians are like that tumbleweed. Whichever whichever way the wind blows, you know, be careful. If someone comes up to you and says, hey, I've learned something new from the Bible. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. I remember when I started to pastor and preach more often, I was always excited to try to find something new from the Bible. I just wanted something that no one had heard before. Be weary of something that you've never heard before, you know. And, and so the Bible says that we are, to be, we are to be rooted, you know. So many Christians have no roots in their life. We want to be rooted and then built up in him. Hebrews 12, verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let us have grace. uh, Excuse me, it's God's grace that helps us to be rooted in him. But also, let her see, if you're taking notes tonight, God's grace will secure the Christian. God's grace will secure the Christian. Uh, most of the time, if, a, if a, a teacher, a pastor is teaching on the grace of God, uh, normally they're going to mention 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Uh, it's when the apostle Paul said, my, you know, of Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, we really don't know the strength of an anchor unless there's a storm, unless there's a force fighting against it. And, and the Bible teaches us that, that we are secure in Christ. No matter what storm that comes into our life, that God's grace is sufficient. You know, God doesn't always isolate us from harm. You know, he, he doesn't always remove the troubles, but he does always surround us with his grace. He always surrounds us with his grace. A vine clings to an oak tree and in so doing finds protection in the time of trial. If a violent storm arises and the vine is on the side of the tree away from the wind, the tree serves to protect the tree from the wind. If the vine is on the side of the tree exposed to the wind, the wind will only press it to the tree that it already clings to. In the storms of our life, God will at times set himself between us and the fury of the storm and protect us from it. But in other times, we will be exposed to that storm. But as it rages by the grace of God, it will only press us closer to him by his grace, by his grace. There's the potential of grace here. 
and the opportunity to thrive and to grow, even in troubles, by the grace of God. But number two, would you look at this? And you could write it down, the prevention of grace. The prevention of grace. That's hard to read, isn't it? (laughs) Who created that? The prevention of grace. Now, verse number 17 is a warning here. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. The Bible says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, uh, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. You know, a warning system is an incredible device. If you live in a home, you should have smoke alarms and you should have carbon monoxide detectors. They can save your life. And you should always make sure the batteries are also changed because if, if you don't have good batteries, it's useless, right? You could have the alarm and it could be the latest model. I mean, it can have all the bells and all the whistles, but if it doesn't have power, it's useless. So check your batteries. I think you're supposed to check them at time change, right? What, that's coming up. That's, is it fall back, right? Does that mean we gain an hour's sleep or do we lose an hour's sleep? We gain, that's a blessing. But of course, winter's coming. That's not a blessing. Warning systems are important. And uh, we find in this passage of Scripture a, a warning system. You know, there are cities who have warning systems that they will warn of a tornado. They'll warn of a hurricane. Uh, in 2005, during the tsunami that brought great destruction on Thailand and Indonesia, USA Today reported that the West Coast of Thailand and Indonesia did not have tsunami sensors on buoys. And because of that, uh, they weren't able to warn the people of the destruction that was coming. In fact, they said that if they would have had these uh, warning systems in place, that the people would have received warnings three to 12 hours in, in, in advance. And that makes a big difference. Makes a big difference. The BBC said this, Indonesia earthquake and tsunami, how warning system failed the victims. The Bible gives us a warning system. And we see, first of all, letter A, beware, lest ye forget what you already know. In fact, in verse 17, the Bible says that Peter is writing not to give them anything new, but to stir up what they already know, what they already know. Uh, to stir them up. Uh, Our knowledge needs to be translated into our lifestyle. Uh, I was reading about Martin Luther, and he he once spent three days in a a dark, black depression, and uh, something had gone wrong in his life, and, and he really felt terrible about it. And on the third day of this great depression he was going through, his wife came downstairs, and she was all dressed in mourning clothes, And he looked at her and said, who's dead? And she said, God. And Luther rebuked her and said, what do you mean God is not dead? And she said, then stop acting like he had. In other words, listen, the Bible teaches us that we need to stir up the thoughts that we, and the truths that we already know. I remember someone that was reading the Bible, was reading about, they were reading the Bible, and they came to the pastor, and they said, well, pastor, there's so many things I don't understand in the Bible. And the pastor said, but there's so many things that you do understand and don't do. So why don't you focus on those things, and you'll be busy for a long time. The reality is, is we're stirring up these things. And, and, and this is going to help us and protect us uh, from, from the thought of being tripped up. Or the idea here uh, in this passage of Scripture is to fall from your own steadfastness. The Bible says in Psalm 95 verse 8, it says, Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Colossians 2.7, we looked at this, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, 
as ye have been taught. Notice there, we're stirring up what uh, we already know. And, and we're getting excited about we, what we already know. It says in verse 8 of Colossians 2, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So many Christians get on rabbit trails, and they even go after things that are good things, but they miss out on the best things. And the Bible teaches us here that we are to be rooted, and we are to be built up, and we are to be established in the faith, and we need to be reminded of the things we already know that we've been taught from Sunday school. And sometimes someone has to come to us when we're going through a trouble, and we're going through a trial, and just simply say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? I mean, let's get back to the, the beginning here and remember that God still loves us and stir that up in our hearts. And there's a danger here. And this is why there is this, this warning system that is put in place that Peter is reminding them of to be careful that you forget about these things and, and you think that you're steadfast and you think you're rooted, but you can, you can easily uh, be, be taken from that place. And, uh, and in a moment, you can be where you never thought you'd be. And, and so the Bible teaches us here to stir up what we know and to put that into practice uh, into our life. Don't let jealousy or pettiness uh, or anger derail you from God's best in your life. There's a danger there. I was reading about Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker, and uh, both of them had churches in London in the 19th century, and, uh, and, and both of them have, had orphanages. And, and on one occasion, Parker commented on the poor condition of children admitted to Spurgeon's orphanage. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was reported to Spurgeon. It was told of what Parker had said uh, about and how he criticized the orphanage that he was uh, in charge of. And uh, the next Sunday, Spurgeon got behind the pulpit and, and blasted Parker. I mean, let him have it and told him he had no right to say what he did. And so the next Sunday, people, people were flocking to Parker's church because they wanted to hear the rebuttal. They wanted to know what he was going to say back against, against uh, uh, Brother Spurgeon. And so they all came, and they were all listening and waiting, and, and Parker got up on the pulpit and said, I understand Dr. Spurgeon is not in his pulpit today. And this is the Sunday that they usually take an offering for the orphanage. He says, I suggest that we take a love offering here instead. And everyone was delighted. In fact, they had to empty the collection plates three times. It reminds me of the pastor who stood up. A church was in the, in the middle of a building project, and the pastor stood up and said, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is we have enough money for the new auditorium. And everyone was hollering and cheering, and they were so excited. He said, but the bad news is it's still in your wallets. <laughs> they emptied it three times. And later that week, there was a knock on Parker's study. And it was Charles Spurgeon. And he said, you know, Parker... You have practiced grace on me. You have given me not what I deserved. You have given me what I needed. It is God's grace that gives to us what we need. And it's God's grace that we grow. And we cannot grow if we're sidetracked, chasing after everything and anything. And the devil loves it when a Christian's distracted. Our goal in our life our purpose is to be like Jesus, is to be like Jesus. But also beware lest you fall from your steadfastness to stumble in the faith. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the, the truth in love 
may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Matthew 7, verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore, whatsoever, uh, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. I remember I was, uh, we had, a, had a Brother Kingsbury here for uh, our, our um, special services uh, several years ago. And uh, Brother Kingsbury had run a successful addictions program for many years. And there was a gentleman who wanted to come and talk with him. He was uh, facing and, and struggling with addictions. And I remember Brother Kingsbury took him to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 and uh, the Bible says uh, here that we are wise when we do these things. And, and that's for all of us today. We are wise when we do what God has commanded us to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 15, looking diligently, uh, least, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. This is not speaking about losing your salvation failing of the grace of God, but it's talking about an individual who won't accept the grace of God or God's help and resources in their life to help them with the difficulties and burdens of their life. And because they push the grace of God away, what happens? A root of bitterness springs up and it affects their life. It troubles them, but it also troubles everyone around them. And so we, we cannot push away the grace of God uh, we have to remember that it's God's grace in our life during the situations that we face that helps us to thrive. And, and God wants to build us. The devil wants to destroy us. But God wants us to grow, and he wants us to move forward. And so we want to acknowledge God in our life. You know, the Bible says to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and to lean not on your own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge God? What does that mean? I remember I studied that for my own personal uh, devotions. What does it mean to acknowledge God? You know, I believe coming here tonight, you're acknowledging God in your life. You're saying, God, you're important. I need to be here uh, because I understand that I'm in a spiritual battle and there's dangers out there and I want to thrive and I want to grow and, and I want you to direct my paths. And, you know, every time we come together as a family and we pray for our food, you know what you're doing? You're acknowledging God. You're saying, God, listen, you provided this for us. You say, no, wait a minute. I worked hard for what I have. Yeah, but listen, and just like this, you could lose all of your strength. It is God who has given to you what you have. And it's acknowledging God. And the Bible says he will direct your past. That's a wonderful blessing. And so we see in this passage of Scripture the potential of grace, the, the prevention of grace, uh, but also notice thirdly, I want us to think about the power of grace and we'll be done. It says, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Of course, the grace of God begins at salvation and there is the power to save. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace is unmerited favor, unmerited favor. And it is given to us not because we deserve it. If someone gives you grace, you know, the Bible teaches us that our conversation ought to be in grace. When someone's hollering, screaming at you at work, and you give them a soft answer, you've just given them grace. Not what they deserve, but what they need. And, and the Bible says that God has given us grace. He's provided a way of salvation for us, and we receive it through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3, verse 4, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior a uh, uh, love of God toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. 
the Bible says that God's grace was evident at salvation. And, and, and we see that the grace of God is able to save us. God's love flows from his character, not from us. It's nothing to do with us. It's all because of who God is. His love is not dependent upon anything we have done or will do. Uh, If you do nothing to serve him, if you don't lift up another finger for the Lord for the rest of your life, he will love you no less. This is the grace of God. And it's incredible. It's incredible. The story is told of a a famous preacher who was driving through a small southern town. And uh, he was stopped by a police officer for speeding. And uh, he was charged with speeding. And uh, the preacher admitted his guilt. And the officer told him that in the small town, there was a courtroom and he had to go and appear before the judge. And so he did so. And so the preacher came before the judge. He pleaded guilty. And uh, and this was a long time ago, and he said that would be ten dollar a ten dollar fine. And uh, as he was as he was saying that, you know, he said ten dollars for he went over ten miles, I think, over the speed limit, so that's a dollar per mile. Wow, how things have changed, eh? <laughs> and uh, as he was saying all of that, the judge recognized who he was, and uh, he stopped for just a moment, and he said, "You violated the law." And the fine must be paid. But he said, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to pay for you. And so that's, that's mercy, by the way. That's mercy, not getting what we do deserve. And so he took money out of his wallet and put it into that fine and said, it's paid for. And Jesus showed us mercy. He paid for our debt. But you know what that judge said to that famous preacher? He said, now I'm going to take you for a steak dinner. That's grace. That's giving us what we don't deserve. And that's what God has done in our salvation. He did not give to us what we do deserve, but instead he gave to us what we don't deserve. And that's eternal life and salvation. And that, the famous preacher said, that's how God treats a repentant sinner. That's a wonderful blessing to know of the grace of God. But not only does it have power to save, it also has power to glorify God. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 28, wherefore we receiving a, uh, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God uh, accept, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It is by the grace of God that we can live our life in a way that honors the Lord. And it's by the grace of God that we can bring glory to his wonderful name. And that's God's grace, and it's at work in your life today so that you would live your life to bring glory to the Lord. You know, I, I think when we consider the grace of God, we, we cannot really consider God's grace uh, without thinking about the story of John Newton. And John Newton, uh, John Newton, of course, he wrote the hymn, famous hymn, Amazing Grace. And uh, until 1755, his life was, was chiefly at sea, um, and uh, he had become the captain of a slave ship. And uh, he, had lo- he had lived a drunken life uh, apart from God, and he was saved by the grace of God. Uh, his life was changed Never, never the same. And uh, he set out to put an end to slavery. And he became a preacher of the gospel. And he understood the power of the gospel and God's grace to save and ultimately to live his life to bring glory to God. He said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind, but now I see. It's that amazing grace that's at work in our life today to bring us more like Jesus. And we must be obedient children and follow God's direction for our life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity.